should never forget how young they were. 30 years ago, these three dared to confront an unimaginable evil. Stefan Gold was the youngest unit commander in Mossad. David Peretz had his 29th birthday while on the mission. Rachel Singer was only 25 when she crossed through the checkpoint into Soviet-controlled East Berlin. So first time in the field. Good, that's good. Welcome to the mission. So uh, the first thing I want to ask you, uh, after seeing this film, uh, what can you tell me are some of the major differences and, and challenges doing a movie uh, like this one, uh, where you're in kind of this enclosed space with just a couple of other actors versus uh, some other films we've seen you in that are, you know, 3D and big um, special effects and creatures. And this one it was, reminded me of the movies I used to do in Australia, which were like, um, you know, you've got less time for one, you know, you don't have as much money to make blockbusters in Australia, but the speed of doing it then is, you know, indicative of when you kind of make it. It's, you know, there's a pace on it. Every day, it's kind of an intense process. There's not much waiting around. And, the, you know, I love that kind of way and pace of making a movie. And it kind of, especially in a thriller, it helps you kind of keep pace and... What happened? Nothing, nothing. What's the matter? He can understand us. What? He just spoke to me. He knows what we're saying. He knows what we're thinking. It's all right. It's all right, this will be over soon. Why didn't you go? At the station, you could have got away. Why didn't you? One of the things I found most interesting from like an acting perspective with this movie was it, a lot of the movie takes place in close quarters mm -hmm. with just a few people. It, it, does it almost feel more like a play at that point? Is it, is it different than like movies mm. where there's a lot of different locations and big sets and stuff like that? Yeah, you know, it's funny. Every film, to me, everything kind of feels like a play, I guess. I guess the one thing that makes, it, that makes this feel like a play more than anything else is that John Madden shot those, um, the safe house stuff in um, sequence which is great, and that very rarely happens. So we really got to discover our relationship, um, Sam Worthington, Martin Chokas, and myself. We got to discover what happens with our characters and how it goes from the introduction to kind of the um, freak out that we all have towards the end of that section. Uh, and we got to live it day by day as, as the days progressed, so did the days for our characters. Jessica mentioned in the safe house in particular, how, how, yeah, you shot, uh, and, and it's an unusual choice because a lot of movies obviously aren't shot that way. Well, no, I, I mean, I think it, it's a good sort of, it's, it's a good default setting to do that if you can. In this case, I felt it was absolutely vital to do that, just to allow the, the actors to experience that progression and the director to experience that progression because you learn as you go along about oh, I thought I'd shoot it that way, but I realize I don't want to shoot it that way at all now because you've experienced it and you know it and you're learning as you go. Um, so, so that was important. Uh, you know, the, 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 the distinction that I would draw was the, the two women, Jessica and Helen, I certainly did put together before the movie started so that they could breathe one another's oxygen, as it were, and uh, just just get a sense of who each other was, which they absolutely did, and went off into a corner and made certain plans, which I didn't necessarily know about. Uh, no, I mean, uh, that said, I think, it, you know, an, an audience is an accomplice in the way the story is told. In this case, perhaps more of a an overt one than it would normally be. <laughs> Where have you come from? Argentina. Really? Whereabouts? Cordoba. <coughs> what were you doing there? My husband is an industrial chemist. He does look like a chemist. <coughs> um, well, I have to tell you, uh, 
probably the most exciting thing about this movie for me is uh, I've spent several hours a week for the last seven months training in Krav Maga. Yeah, yeah. And uh, it's, it, just knowing what the movie was about. As you I know, it's like, an, a, the attacking form of self-defense, which uh, I love. Like, yeah. You know, it's, I, compared to any other self-defense where it's all about, you know, yeah, every, run away, every, live to every fight another day. Every defense yeah. uh, is also an offense. Yeah, yeah which I loved. I, you know, and I yeah. felt that really helps into the, you know, the mindset of the young Mossad agent that mm -hmm. no matter at what cost, you're going to you know, finish your mission. Yeah. You know, even if it hurts you physically, emotionally, mentally, you're going to achieve your goal. Neutralize the threat. That's yeah, the that's right. Yeah. yeah. Except in this case, the threat is a monster that really digs into their heads. So, uh, how much of that did you get to do in terms of uh, in terms of uh, studying that? I mean, there's all this great training. I learned it and talked. Well. Yeah, my my character doesn't really have to do that much. I get taken mm -hmm. down by Jessica and Martin in the scene if you if you look at it. <laughs> um, but I love that kind of way of thinking. I love that forward attacking way of thinking. I thought it was very unique. You know, I didn't have any experience with hand-to-hand -hand combat. Of course, you know, at Juilliard, we had <laughs> fight combat, but it was more like for Shakespeare with Maybe broad fencing. swords. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> so this was a whole new ballpark for me. I worked um, with someone in Los Angeles, um, and for three and a half months before, a couple times a week, his name was Roy, he was really great. One of the first things he said to me was, you know, it's not about um, self-defense. Mm -hmm. It's about killing your opponent as quickly as possible. Yeah, neutralizing the threat. Done. Yeah. And I remember you're not trying to survive, you're trying to prevail. Exactly. Yeah. And it's just, you have to be quick and efficient. Uh, and that, I was like, wow, this is ruthless. It, was, it really made me feel like a badass, I'm not going to lie. I knew this would happen. I knew we'd be punished. I knew we'd have to pay. I thought I'd been punished already. God doesn't plant car bombs. I wasn't referring to the wheelchair. If I could go back, Rachel, I would change it all. But there's one thing I would never change. She isn't going to find out. She can never find out. So one of the things that I think has been exciting to talk about here today is uh, you have such great actors. Uh, you get you get two actors per character, which not every yes, director I know. gets to do. Doubling up. The story is has a particular shape to it. It deals with a, a sequence of events that happen in the mid '60s. Very very intense, powerful events that mark and affect the lives of the four people involved in very powerful ways obviously because of the circumstances um, that it's about and the film also deals with a point a very specific point 30 years later where though those people are examining the reverberations of you know what happened in their lives the reverberations in their lives of those events so in some senses they're they're literally partitioned from one another mm -hmm. and those people are looking back at things they did and asking themselves if they recognize that behavior, what they feel about it and so forth. So strangely, the idea of double casting that seems like a completely logical way to go. But it also means that I didn't want the film to become, uh, you know, mired in the sense of, you know, does this actor inherit Sam Worthington's tics or whatever? Right. Because the audience is not interested in that or concerned mm -hmm. with that. Well, they might be if the story were not gripping them <laughs> and, it, and, it, and if they were not compelled by the issues and the questions that the story is asking, but hopefully they are. And therefore it's a, simply a convention that the audience enters into. I mean, that said, of course, I let the older actors particularly see the 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 scenes that we'd already shot because I shot it chronologically. Uh, did you do anything with your future counterpart as far as uh, was there any collaboration about how to play the character? Well, we talked for about forty five minutes to an hour or something, not that long. More, I just gave him the emotional arc I was looking at, and then I think you trust when you're Kieran Hines, Tom Wilkinson, Helen Mirren that they're going to hold up their end of the movie. Yeah. Um, you know, Oscar nominated and Oscar winning actors, you tend to yeah. kind of know that part's going to be fine.